for, I'm going to talk maybe a little bit faster today because I have a fair amount of content to get through. Uh, for virtual audience participation, I have a couple of uh, guidances on the slides to notify you when to, when to start chiming in for the chat feature. Uh, talking about alkylating and platinating agents today, and uh, the history of these agents were initially as mustard gases during World War I. Scientists had noticed that lymph tissue shrunk dramatically in, in uh, um, patients and, and soldiers that impacted by the mustard gases. And so development of uh, mechlorethamine uh, led to a slightly more stable drug that could be used uh, in lymphoma at Dana-Farber um, and, and Yale. Uh, this paper was known about during World War II, but it was actually not published until after the war. And so uh, this also led to other uh, therapies, alkylating agents, platinating agents. The chat poll question here is, how many UW patients per year are treated with platinating therapy? What is your guess? How many total do we treat per year? There's seven different subclasses of these agents. And uh, the, it, it's really interesting if you're a, a fan of science and evolution of, of design, um, how, how these things uh, kept evolving. The Azeridians, for example, were a purely rational, like mathematic calculus-based design of the cation to make it as perfectly stable uh, chemistry-wise as possible. Uh, Nitroscurias were a random National Cancer Institute screening of compounds looking for uh, leukemic activity. Triazines were initially developed as anti-metabolites. Um, uh, other uh, biophysics researchers um, in California and other places had figured out uh, platinating agents. And let's see here, any, any poll responses yet? I'm not seeing any. But so here today we'll talk about 15 drugs and um, the I, mechlorethamine is still available uh, from the F FDA, but we really don't use it anymore because it has much too high of a secondary cancer risk. Um, so our most common um, uh, alkylating agent would be cyclophosphamide by far, and we'll talk a little bit about um, why that is. And then you'll see that the platinum agents we have treated a 1,165 patients last year. So it's a, a really relatively large class um, for treatment. Um, the column, the second to, from the left column shows which disease-oriented teams commonly use these drugs. So platinum agents, you'll see those in uh, gyne cancers, breast cancers, lung. Um, and the alkylating agents have a little bit more limited effect uh, in general, more BMT liquid tumor uh, dosing, but cytoxin still has quite the role in uh, breast cancer. Um, and um, it's another thing to note, I guess, is the FDA approval. So mechlorethamine was back in 1946, but then many agents started to be developed in the 1950s and um, all the way you know, 2002 for oxaliplatin. So uh, many decades of development of these drugs. Uh, Right now, there's about 530 uh, standard protocols um, uh, for, for adults. And the alkylating agents, platinating agents used to be, you know, a much higher percentage of, of the standard care protocols now that oral chemotherapies and ICPIs have taken up much more of the landscape. Um, these drugs are still around, but not used uh, as commonly. Um, the definition of these drugs is it's simply a compound capable of covalently binding an alkyl group to a biomolecule. And usually that will be a DNA, RNA, or protein. And the essential concept is there's nucleophilic regions in the DNA molecules, in RNA molecules, and in proteins. And so the alkylating agent has exceptionally good leaving groups. So the chloride uh, in, in the mechlorethamine molecule is leaving there forming this beautiful cation that uh, can be set up for electrophilic attack by the nucleophilic rich region. So going back to organic chemistry, it's relatively straightforward um, mechanism. Um, a second chat poll um, is looking at what, what percentage of these alkylating agents include package insert warnings for secondary cancer. 
Um, so, so we're talking um, today about uh, um, 12 of these uplighting agents and what, what percentage of those 12 have this in the uh, package insert. So the, like uh, these work in a number of different ways. You can see uplight iguanine um, with cytosine. So it, the CG pair is normal, it's standard. So two hydrogen bonds there to stabilize. And then when you have a, an actual in the middle, uplighted guanine forms better with thymine. So um, that's a mis mismatch pair. Um, so three three bonds would be preferentially uh, formed with thymine. On the right hand side, you can see intrastrand formation, um, intrastrand formation are, are cross linking with other molecules. All right, so black box warnings. I'm loving the guesses here. Thank you for uh, the chat. Um, uh, black box warnings uh, of these 15 agents, 12 total warnings, and we'll go through most of these today. Um, the uh, bottom one, experienced provider, I, I'm not going to tell you guys what, what that is, um, but it is interesting that it's noted. The medication error prevention for lomustine, that was actually mentioned yesterday. That's a black box warning. You have to dispense only one dose at a time. Um, it's one dose every six weeks, so we can't do any three-month supplies or any, anything like that. Um, there's been many, many reports of problems. I made the platinum agents kind of that sapphire platinum color, and you can kind of see, I mean, yeah, there is some um, uh, differences between platinum agents and alkylating agents, but there's also many similarities. I also pulled the warnings and precautions from the package inserts. And um, here there's 34 warnings and precautions. I kind of organized this roughly by system. There's a little bit of fluctuation going on. Um, I'll call out a few things. So autotoxicity uh, for cisplatin is much higher in kids. It's about double the rate in kids than adults. So be especially careful there, but also um, realize it happens in adults. Um, disulfiram reaction with procarbazine, that's, uh, you know, got to watch that in, in Wisconsin with uh, various um, uh, activities that patients uh, are involved in. Then our second warning, and here's the answer to the, uh, the chat poll question. So 13 of these agents uh, have secondary cancer. 100% of the alkylating agents um, have secondary cancer listed. So carboplatin and oxaliplatin do not have that listed in the warning. And it's probably one of the reasons that platinum agents are used in, you know, 1,165 patients for a year here. Um, that, that's a nice effect to um, avoid. Um, it is still in, the, in there for cisplatin, of course. Um, and in this chart, I, if I did a marked it with a black box, that, that means it's actually, actually uh, in the black box warning, not just the warning and precaution. Um, Mylosuppression, uh, all 15 of these agents are involved. Um, and so, and then hypersensitivity, 11 of the agents uh, um, have hypersensitivity listed as a, as a uh, warning and precaution, or for carboplatin, it's actually a black box warning. That's because it's up to 16% of patients that have hypersensitivity with carboplatin. Um, Okay, so we'll kind of dive into these uh, various adverse effects, and I'll start with the effects that uh, are, uh, affect both alkylating agents and um, platinum agents. So here's neutropenia. Um, the like, cyclophosphamide, again, is just really beautiful. So seven-day onset of nadir, uh, seven-day onset, nadir in 10 to 14 days, totally clean by 21 days. We love that, uh, breast cancer patients, um, lymphoma patients, it doesn't really matter. Everyone kind of has the same result. For things like melphalan and busulfan and carmustine, we, we take advantage of those principles in the bone marrow transplant population. And so we, we love to have a nice clean space for the transplanted cells to have a shot to, to uh, um, engraft. And so there's different, different mechanisms to, to watch here. Um, Benda mustine can have, you know, these little old 70, 80 year old people can have a really prolonged mater. So that's, that's one thing to watch for, for sure. 
All right, next is NCCN guidelines, um, febrile neutropenia. So high risk for febrile neutropenia is if you did not get, um, uh, did not have prophylaxis, would you develop febrile neutropenia? Um, and so you can see, this is a high risk, uh, several examples of regimens. Um, many of these regimens have either alkylating agents or platinum agents. So it's a huge, huge issue that we have to watch. Uh, here's our first, like, please uh, throw in your chat um, kind of questions or thoughts. Um, so inpatient hematology round, 65-year-old, admitted for, he had a fever, he's on appropriate antibiotics, uh, non-chodchum lymphoma, RCHOP, he's day 10 following uh, cycle two, ANC 334, uh, clinically stable. Do you want to start growth factor or not? What do you, what do you guys think? Back to the cyclophosphamide on the very top there. We're expecting the nadir at 10 to 14 days. And so uh, there's a couple points of uh, um, thought here. Uh, you know, so if, if the patient had been on a short acting growth factor prior to admission, please go ahead and, and continue it. Um, and um, the uh, it's a real problem nowadays with uh, um, looking at like what growth factor the patient actually got if they did get it. So we have four different short acting growth factors available and we have three different long acting growth factors available. So if they get a long acting growth factor, we're not gonna continue that. We're gonna expect that to last at least 14 days. Um, so uh, we'll just watch the patient. And if they were started on it before for some reason, like maybe they're 65 and an older, older patient, um, then you continue the short acting until you had uh, neutrophil recovery. Um, on the bottom, I, I kind of agree with Chad. If he wasn't on it before, um, uh, he's not septic, he doesn't have severe ANC, we don't expect prolonged neutropenia with this regimen. We're expecting, uh, you know, recovery um, within 10 days. Doesn't, you know, no pneumonia, based fungal infection, hospitalization at time of fever are prior episodes. So in the next cycle of chemo, we could consider starting prophylaxis, and um, I posted the web link there for the um, guideline for neutropenic fever. Um, uh, so feel free to take a look. I, hopefully it comes through in the chat, okay? Um, they have a link to the order set that we use, um, as well as, as guidance on how to, how to, how to um, treat patients in the emergency room setting and clinic or in the hospital. All right, moving on, next. I hope I'm not going too fast here. I just had to try to catch up. So let me know in the chat if I'm going too fast. But so here's a, a chart to kind of impress upon you the, you know, uh, anaemesis wasn't, it was only in uh, um, four of the package inserts for a warning and precaution. But you can see this is the, the vast majority of uh, the high moderate and high risk uh, regimens we have. Um, uh, have a um, platinum agent or a alkylating agent. And so this is defined by ASCO. So high percentage would be without prophylaxis, 90% of patients would develop uh, amicis with cisplatin. Um, and then going to high moderate, low moderate. And we, we develop uh, um, different uh, treatment plan, um, supportive care modalities for these different uh, uh, risk categories. Uh, let's see here. Just throwing up the ASCO guideline. Oops. Okay. So, um, in this is an example in um, cisplatin atopicide, and this would be a multiple day regimen. So in these regimens, we like to use palinocitron because it has a 40-hour half-life, and um, it can can last through those five days. So we'll we'll give it two two doses through the five days. Um, Phosphoprepidant, or a prepidant, it'll have dexamethasone and then some as needed medications. On the high risk, we will add olanzapine, like plus minus olanzapine. So some regimens will have have it, and others won't. Here's the next chat, so um, feel free to weigh in there. We have a patient that is um, 
admitted he had dehydration, a little bit of touch of renal failure, four days of vomiting. Um, he had primary CNS lymphoma. Methotrexate, we're not talking about that today, so that's probably not the problem. He's nine days out from that. Um, we're thinking it's probably related to temozolomide. And just looking at the chart again, um, we're seeing temozolomide in the uh, low moderate section. So the oral chemos can still have a medic uh, potential for sure. So any any thoughts on management um, for, for this case? And this is actually, this actually changed our practice here. Um, we had a patient exactly like this. And what we ended up doing is changing the treatment plan to add in a scheduled dose of ondansetron before dose of the temozolomide. So when these patients first go home, we always tell them to take either a half tab, four milligrams, or a full tab, eight milligram dose, 30 minutes before every dose. We also tell them to take it at bedtime. And um, we used to have, we had multiple admissions with temozolomide nausea, and after doing that change, um, it, it did help. Um, other things, so nausea is huge, like um, there is a health facts for you document that's pretty good for educating patients, but these are some of my favorites. Um, some patients will have to be uh, admitted to the infusion center for, you know, a bowl of fluids. Um, we might want to increase the prophylaxis in future cycles. That would be like if, if we confirm that the patient used the prescribed NMetic therapy appropriately. In palliative and 10 chemo, occasionally we'll, we'll uh, cut up doses. That's not very common. And then dietitians here are happy to meet with patients to talk about tips for managing nausea. It's a good resource to have. Um, I shared the link for the, the ASCO update. And as you can see in the uh, screenshot here, there's a lot of tools. So there's slide set, there's patient information, there's risk charts. There's pocket cards, um, there's even podcasts. And this is updated roughly every three to four years. Um, and it's throughout your career, just please pay attention to these updates. Uh, take a look every time they come out. They're really, um, they commonly have updates. Like uh, this, this, type, this guideline is one that gets um, relatively large updates every three to four years. So it's, it's really good to keep uh, attention. All right, next case. So, we're going to um, move away from the super common uh, effects now, and we'll start with neuro and go head to tail on, on kind of the adverse effects that happen. Um, so here is a patient secure chat. Got to love it. Um, yeah, like a lot of the um, nurses know the patient super well, which is really, really handy that you get a timeline over even, you know, many years. So agitated, confused, uh, abnormally somnolent, um, started cycle one yesterday, so it's been, you know, less than 24 hours. What do you think this is and how do you, how do you think we should manage it? Okay, so here we have neurotoxicity from mifosamide and this is a nice clean toxicity profile, so it's it's uh, like uh, kind of fun that we know what we're talking about here. <laughs> um, Chloralacetaldehyde uh, accumulates uh, due to depleted electron uh, transport chain, and so there's not enough uh, uh, precursors available to clean this up to a safe metabolite. Incidence in high-dose uh, ifosamide is uh, uh, less than 10% a year. It, I'd say we. So we, we treat 10 to 12 patients a year with ifosamide and they will get multiple cycles. Um, we probably have this happen about uh, roughly twice a year. Um, so it also occurs with procarbazine and thiotepa. There's an initial, there's a real warning sign, like initially it's erosibility, disorientation, it happens with almost every patient. There's a little window, it's kind of like a prodromal thing. And then it progresses to you, don't really know where, like it totally sucks that we can't tell where this is gonna stop. But you can see any number of these things happen and um, uh, basically just have to manage it with uh, supportive care. And uh, as the, the chat feature says, uh, methylene blue is a good option here. So onset within two hours to 20 days, usually it's within 48 hours, almost always. Um, we, as far as I know, we haven't had a patient um, 
that's left the hospital that developed it, bit, but it theoretically could happen. And then it does usually resolve. It takes a, um, uh, you know, it takes uh, two to three days to re resolve, and it's kind of scary. And the family uh, is, you know, uh, very concerned. So, so the team, but um, it usually will go away um, uh, in a couple of days. Risk factors, and this is super key. Uh, a lot of these patients are uh, relapsed patients, and they have um, other things uh, going on. And organ function is obviously often impacted, and so. The patients that develop this, uh, I would like 90% must have one of these risk factors are usually multiple. So low serum albumin, um, uh, renal insufficiency, make sure you watch for this and you could consider actually um, uh, prophylaxis with methylene blue if, if this is deemed uh, a high enough risk. So here's a treatment and prevention. So we're restoring the pathway, right? We're making it so, uh, we have a safe clearance of uh, chloral acetaldehyde, and also the like, two mechanisms also blocking mono uh, monoamine oxidase, which which prevents the formation to begin with. So two different mechanisms. Our treatment dose is 50 milligrams IV Q4 hours, and uh, again, the recovery time once you once you started is is a little bit faster, and then secondary prophylaxis. Or we have done occasionally for primary prophylaxis for somebody deemed really high risk is 50 mg uh, IV Q6 hours. And here's what methylene blue looks like in the, in the toilet. It's um, uh, interesting to, to see. Um, okay, so we'll move on to uh, our next neuro topic, peripheral neuropathy. Again, I cannot stress how important uh, this, um, this is for, for patients. Um, the, uh, comments here, the incidences and comments are mostly related to oxaliplatin, but you can generalize to cisplatin and cardioplatin as well. So acute onset, uh, it comes on relatively quickly within hours to one or two days of dosing. Um, it often, like the next time you get oxaliplatin, so if you're doing full FOX every two weeks, you're gonna get it again, and it'll hopefully go away. Uh, generally, um, it, it can be a dose limiting toxicity. So. At the very bottom there is uh, looking about ADLs, so self-care ADL. So can you can you take a shower? Can you button your shirt? Um, can you um, uh, do dishes? Make, can you eat? Uh, can you use a fork? Uh, for persistence, it, it may or may not be reversible. Um, so these are uh, damaging the dorsal horn of the nerve. And nerves are very, very slow growing. If you damage them, it, it, it is going to last a long time. So. Paresthesia, dysphysia, hypothesias, and you know, writing, buttoning, swallowing. Um, it's uh, really, really problematic. Um, all right, let's see. Hopefully a few people take a stab at this chat poll question. Um, um, so we're like the ASCO guidelines for um, peripheral neuropathy. And uh, sorry, let me, I'm gonna throw this in the chat too. So these were updated as well in 2020. And um, the, uh, it, it's something that, it, it's just so depressing every time it comes out. It's unlike CINV where you have a lot of kind of great updates on new therapies. Here you just see further trials that never worked. Um, uh, it's um, really, really depressing. And again, it was last summer, 2020, you know, our, our favorite year is the, again, not good news. So the duloxetine trial um, showed limited efficacy, but I do want to call out on the bottom graph there that for platinums, there is a little bit like stronger favoring of duloxetine than for taxanes. And so really, really, we don't use this enough. We don't try to use it enough. Make sure you're thinking about it. So the dose for this is 30 milligrams for one week and then 60 milligrams thereafter. Um, some people will go up further to 90 milligrams, but and you were talking about a modest benefit. So we're talking about, you know, a 20 to 30% um, reduction in symptoms. But for some people that can make all the difference in the world. So it, it really is something um, important to, to think about. And um, as far as the, uh, no one was brave enough, but the pharmacogenomics in the, in the package insert, it, only cisplatin has one. So it has uh, TPMT, um, it's really funny. They said that there's 
evidence for and evidence against if you have TPMT uh, mutation that you'll have higher peripheral neuropathy. So um, um, it's uh, um, not not a well-known genomic correlation, but it's the only one of the only one in the package insert of Alzheimer's agents and platinum agents. Okay, so this is super super frustrating. I um, there is not so we do not have a health tax for you for peripheral neur uh, neuropathy. We do not have a um, uh, like a really good go to source for peripheral neuropathy. If people are um, computer savvy, I will sometimes share the cancer.net ASCO reference with them, but it's pretty ugly. It's not super readable. Um, so patients with neuropathy have, you, everyone here knows this, but stories I've heard is like, I would rather die than not be able to knit. Um, I would, from an artist I heard, um, I will not be able to make any more money if my neuropathy gets worse. Um, I heard uh, a 30-year-old um, that um, broke her grandma's china dish from 100, it was a 100-year-old china, she broke one of the dishes by dropping it. Um, so it's, it's, uh, um, it's, you know, these kind of education points and things are, are really important to discuss with patients. Um, it, you know, again, with oxaliplatin, we're talking about two thirds of patients, uh, end up, uh, dealing with this. And so, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm still not seeing any, any good, good, uh, um, patient education handouts. And if ever, anyone ever finds one, I, I have used mail before it's, it's, somewhat okay, but like it, it'd really be a nice project to pursue. And again, I hope everyone just kind of contributes to clinical research in peripheral neuropathy moving forward and make sure you get patients enrolled in these trials if we can. Hopefully someday we'll have some sort of answer for this because it really is one of the main reasons we can't use these drugs as much. Okay, so then next will be many adverse effects that don't impact many people. So I'm gonna go through them kind of quickly given the time here. Um, the uh, mu cell fan lung was the first pulmonary toxin. The, the metabolites are known to be toxins. The bummer with this is that average onset is four years. So we've already given the therapy usually. Um, a lot of workup issues to, to go through. So lung biopsy, rule out opportunistic infections, um, uh, may or may not respond to steroids. Um, F, um, VC and DLCO, uh, our risk factors up front. Of course, obviously, like smoking, COPD, but those patients will have, have lower scores. Um, so this is not common. It's, we, we will see this maybe once every two years. Cardiovascular toxicity, you probably noticed there wasn't a ton of warnings and precautions on cardiovascular um, toxicity. The, our, our, sorry, I apologize. There was not a lot of black box warnings, but there were more warnings and precautions in the package inserts. And the ones in red are all the, the warnings um, that, that are given. Um, uh, so it's kind of a hodgepodge of stuff. You really have to look it up by, by drug. Liver toxicity, VOD. Um, we have uh, uh, relatively rare again. So probably like kids, uh, kids will have one, -ish, one to two patients a year. Adults will probably have one um, every other year. But good to know about the classic triad, so weight gain, right upper quadrant pain, total ability, ALT. And then um, there's Baltimore criteria, there's Seattle criteria. Uh, we use that to consider defibrotide treatment. Not gonna go into that because it's still rare here, but it's important to know um, that this, this can happen and it's very serious. Um, many, much of this is fatal. So only up to 80% of patients see resolution, the ones that don't generally die. Um, we do have a clinical practice guideline for this. Uh, renal, so hemorrhagic cystitis, um, generally it's occurring with um, ifosamide, uh, any, any dose of ifosamide, high dose cytoxin, and chronic oral uh, cytoxin. This again is rare, so probably uh, one patient, one to two patients every two years, so one, up to one patient a year, I'd say. Um, so you have the imaging, so CT scan, you can see the inflammation around the bladder and uh, hemorrhaging. Um, for this, in a, 
the reason we don't see it very often is our tr treatment plans and our approach is to see, um, you know, to have these preventative uh, therapies up front. So we're giving high dose uh, or aggressive hydration and then MESNA as well. Uh, we're always, always using this with um, ifosamide. MESNA is orally um, bioavailable. Um, really quickly, um, again, another reason we love cytoxin is it breaks down to three end products, two of which are highly um, like alcohol dehydrogenases everywhere in the body. So we're very clean in all humans. Like we don't have interhuman difference and breakdown of this drug. Um, ifosamide, there's a um, six different end products and we can have some variation between people. So you'll see ifosamide doses are always higher than cytoxin doses. Because of that, our acrolein exposure can be much higher as well. And so that's why we're always, always using mesna, always, always using high dose um, fluids. And here's an example of the high dose fluids, ifosamide there with the mesna in the bag. The fourth case here, uh, really we're getting now to renal. Um, so we, you know, you're trying to go to bed, you're looking at your patient list for tomorrow. Her creatinine is dropped significantly for you know, cycle two. Magnesium is also an issue. This is such a bummer because these doses are so high, 100 milligrams of cisplatin. Um, so uh, renal toxicity, um, this is a, a black box warning for cisplatin. Up to 33% of patients have renal toxicity. And then with ifosamide, it's also a black box warning. Carboplatin, cytoxin, lomustine are just warnings. Um, there's a lot of different mechanisms here. It's not as clean as like the neurotoxicity for ifosamide. Um, and then um, the, to kind of approach this, we're making sure we're adequate hydration, we're watching labs, make sure appropriate supplementation, um, and um, making, looking at the risk factors to see if it's appropriate. If you look at cisplatin, the orientated here, so the black box ones are black boxes, red boxes are warnings. Cisplatin, if you're less than 40 creatinine clearance, and this is in the package insert, to consider something else. Um, switch over to carboplatin or, or some, some other therapy. Um, so uh, it's, uh, uh, this chart, uh, I wanted to really point out that the like FDA label wise, almost, almost none of these drugs have information in the FDA label. Um, these medications label, the labels are updated, but um, companies are not likely to go back and do a, a renal dosing trial. And so the information that is here, if there's nothing in the label, is based on uh, uh, peer-reviewed publications, uh, often with low patient numbers. So use caution with interpretation of renal dosing uh, data, always. It's um, a lot of times people come with us, come to pharmacists for the answer on this, and we, we honestly don't know for sure a lot of times. And so we're really working with what, what the patient's uh, um, uh, specific factors are, plus thinking about how, how, to, how to approach this from a somewhat rational manner, but not fully evidence-based. All right, last big effect, hypersensitivity. Um, so two to 16% for uh, carboplatin, but as you saw, it's in every single uh, package insert except for the oral medications. Um, uh, so everyone's seen this, you know, you've, you've all seen this uh, pretty standard. Uh, Onset is within minutes, the care plan, stop the offending agent immediately, get vitals. And then I just wanted to point out that we do have this um, hypersensitivity guideline. And um, it's, it's a really good guideline. It actually has symptom-driven uh, emergency medications. And just so um, um, it's, you can, you're not really gonna make a mistake by throwing fomotidine at somebody, somebody with shortness of breath but this is more rational and it's not too hard to memorize this, these pathways. Um, and we've found a lot of luck with them. They've worked, they've worked really, really well, so. Okay, so third year, I'm so sorry because I usually bring stuff in like every other year to make sure I get every class. My wife and I love to bake and cook and we we're just so bummed with the pandemic, um, but I, I hope this, Oh, it's popular. I've only seen one book. Um, 
Let's see. Okay, so carboplatin, again, 16% of patients have problems. And so um, uh, we have a desensitization protocol that works fantastic. The only problem is like it takes hours for, for patients to go through this. Um, but uh, it's oftentimes carboplatin is our go-to drug for these uh, um, cancers. It's a curative state, like we're trying to trying to cure the cancer and desensitization is much better than switching over to a different uh, um, drug. A lot of dosage forms. So we have like intracavitary biotepa for pleural fusion, <laughs> um, uh, oral IV for melphalan, just uh, carmustine implant wafers, that'd be for brain surgery, just to, just to kind of see. And then lastly, drug interactions. And I'm not gonna, the basic point here is like, look it up. It, there's a lot of variety in drug-drug interactions. So look it up and uh, um, uh, if you, once you have a subspecialty when you're uh, um, in your own practice, you'll, you'll kind of memorize these, but, but it's uh, important to know that different, different things affect. Uh, and we, we do a pretty good job for pharmacy to look at this and screen this, but it still it takes a village for, for uh, everything. So I agree that we, uh, apple sugar we made last weekend, John, and God, they were super good. There's a, in the cold light here. Uh, that's all I have. Any questions?